to Deborah Green. Uh, she's a former entomologist. Uh, she worked with caterpillars, uh, knows her native plants, uh, and this is, you know, close to her heart for sure. And I've actually been over to her house to see a yellow-throated vireo. I was invited, but she has great landscaping and has been growing native plants for years, and uh, she's going to tell you more about it. Okay, thank you, Sam, and thanks everybody for coming. So Plants for Birds, the Caterpillar Connection is my topic. And uh, you might be surprised at <clears throat> the way this is going to lay out that I won't get into the plants for a while. I'm talking more about the caterpillars so, and the birds. Fall and spring migration are exciting times of the year. And this is one of our bird walks at Mead Botanic Gardens. Uh, I think this is a spring one. And there are 37 species of warblers in the Eastern United States, all of them passing through at some point or another, some regularly, some rarely, going north or south to the tropics. And these beautiful photos are by Frank Salmon, uh, a member of ours who caught the bug for warblers going to Mead Gardens and taking pictures. He now wants to photograph all the warblers of the Western Hemisphere. And this is one that he photographed in Costa Rica. And I use it to explain that our migratory warblers are thought to be originally tropical because they spend two thirds of the year in the tropics, only about four months up here. And by the way, most of them don't breed in central Florida. They, they're, just, they're just a couple that do. Most of them are breeding farther north in the Eastern forest. And the other reason why we think that they were originally tropical is because there's a whole lot of species in the tropics. So this is the book. I love this book so much. It was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize in 2000. Um, and I think that's the last time a bird book has been nominated for a Pulitzer Prize, a finalist for a Pulitzer Prize. It's a beautifully written book about migration and you would really benefit from reading it. I've learned so much from it about the way they take off and migrate and how dangerous it is. Um, they, they fly at night to avoid the hawks and it's uh, less turbulence at night and then they come down and feed during the day. Um, many species winter in the Caribbean and um, those don't have so far to go. But those that um, winter farther south in Central America or South America, they have a choice. Do they cross the desert in Mexico or do they fly across the Gulf, 600 miles? And each species has worked it, that out and does it consistently one way or the other. And what's the reward for the risk of, of such a dangerous flight? It is the deciduous forests of the east leafing out and little caterpillars eating the new leaves. And these caterpillars were laid by the moths, the, the, the parent moths, that either overwintered as moths, over, they, the eggs overwintered, or the pupae overwintered. But anyway, as the new leaves uh, come out, the little caterpillars come out. Caterpillars. Soft-bodied little caterpillars. And caterpillars have exoskeletons like all insects, but they're not hard like a beetle. So they're excellent for feeding nestlings. Perfect for feeding nestlings. And easy for a warbler to pick them out. The warbler is just designed to find these caterpillars in between the leaves. And they're soft and they're actually rich in carotenoids, which may be the source of some of the bright colors of the warblers. So songbirds, are very aligned with the leafing out of the deciduous forest. And this is what I learned from Scott Weidensall's book. 
And the conifers have new growth and caterpillars too, not just the deciduous plants. This is a pine warbler. So to review, warblers and other songbirds need caterpillars to feed their young. And as is in this picture shows, they also can use it in migration. This is the black and white warbler from Fort DeSoto that Sam took um, and it's using that uh, just as fuel for the migration. But unfortunately the forests where those caterpillars are uh, have decreased. Um, they have decreased since the 1600s when these European settlers first came and started cutting them down. And it, it continues, continues with development and continues with the burning of the Amazonian forests. So studies have shown that 2.9 billion birds are, have gone since 1970. Bird population studies through Breed Bird Atlas, uh, Christmas bird counts and other means show that data. So what can you do to help songbirds? First, learn to live with caterpillar damage on your plants. Use no pesticides. And second, reduce your lawn and change the palette of plants in your yard to, to plants that foster caterpillars, the native plants of your area. So, so actually, before we continue, there's a question from Mac user that was wondering if you know a good book on math caterpillars, on math caterpillars, moth caterpillars. Uh-huh. I have a book on caterpillars <laughs> in the United States, and I will email that to Mac user. Okay. Thank you. Uh-huh. Um, so let me... Uh, introduce Dr. Doug Tallamy, an entomologist from University of Delaware, which is in the outskirts of Philadelphia. And um, his first book, Bringing Nature Home, from 2007, has been a bestseller. And in this book, he promotes this idea of the plants for the caterpillars, for the birds. And his new book, Nature's Best Hope, just came out in February, this February, and there he talks about, we've really got to do something quickly, and what we need to do is not, is make our native plant landscapes and make them enough, our neighbors, get our neighbors to do it, such that we have a homegrown national park. His concern about that is because only 5% of the United States land is in preserves, which is not enough to preserve diversity. 41% is agriculture, but agriculture, monoculture crops, not suitable to support these birds. And uh, the other 54% is urban and suburban, mostly lawns in the suburban. So that's what we have to work on and try to increase the habitat for birds. And he has evidence that planting native plants helps birds. He had a grad student, Desiree Narango, who studied the chickadees. She monitored reproduction and survival of Carolina chickadees within residential yards and found them when non-native plants increased in the yards, both insect availability and chickadee population growth declined and populations could only be sustained if non-native plants cons constituted less than 30% of plant biomass. Uh, right in the chat, does anybody have chickadees in their yard? You do, Sam? Good. Well, we have chickadees in our yard and I'm proud of it. It means that we have less than 30% um, non-native. Somebody else? I, have, does. Everything. I have everything else but. <laughs> uh -huh. Yes, well now you know how to work to get them. Uh, yeah. just take out a few non-natives and put more natives. And, and this caterpillar connection is, is, is how it, it, it works. And you can just uh, Google the Carolina chickadee story. Um, so to learn about your local native plants, the group is the Florida Native Plant Society. I've been a member since the late 80s 
Um, there are two chapters locally. The tar flower chapter is the big chapter in, in uh, Orlando. And then in Seminole County, we have the couplet burn chapter. Um, <clears throat> the National Audubon Society has a plants for bird effort. And this part of the, their website actually has, you can put in your um, zip code and actually get a list of plants and it's, it's pretty good. And Orange Audubon is committed to this Plants for Bird effort. Um, we have articles uh, a couple times a year and we have at least one talk a year on native planting for wildlife. And um, so you join with us and, you, and watch some of the educational things we do. Um, we haven't done this in a while, but we had a yards tour and it was quite popular. This is my yard. I'm lucky enough to have a, a big one but you don't have to have a big yard to uh, provide habitat for birds. Um, and I just wanna show you way back in 2004, when we first moved in, we had the typical foundation plants around the, the house and we took those out because they, they're not habitat for, they're not food for caterpillars at all. They're the shiny waxy leaved plants like the camellias and the pittosporums and the viburnums, they are selected to not have insects eating them, but we want insects eating them, you see. It's a different concept. So in Bringing Nature Home, Doug Tallamy has one page that has a list of the different plant groups and how many species of caterpillars are on them. Oaks are the top with 534 species and willows, 456, cherries with 456, and birch, and some of these, we, because he's northern, we don't have them here. And so this list doesn't help us that much, but other than those top three, we can work on. And I wanna introduce Mary Kime and Randy Snyder, uh, local bird experts, uh, bird and uh, just general all around na naturalists. And they have a great yard for plants for birds. And they don't feed birds at all. They don't put out bird seed, but they have all the plants and they have great birds. Like I'm very impressed. This is a Nashville warbler, not an easy bird to get. And they have a video that Mary made, um, which you can find on YouTube by uh, looking for Randy hyphen Snyder hyphen Mary hyphen Kine. Those of you who are local, you know their names and you can find that. We'll, we'll, I'll probably provide a link to that at some point. <clears throat> and Mary did this flyer for Orange Audubon of the top plants locally to plant and, and why for each one. So here she, she has the trees, black cherry, cabbage palm, eastern red cedar, live oak, longleaf pine, red maple, sugarberry, or hackberry, winged elm and a whole bunch of others, shrubs and vines and all. So um, we have that flyer available at all our events. Okay, so I'm gonna go through just a few slides of these top groups of plants. The oaks, 534 species of caterpillars throughout the United States. And uh, it's the new leaves that they particularly like. Um, like for instance, we're looking up and we're probably looking up at, at oak trees. That's where the warblers are. The willows, you all know that that's where you look for the uh, war, uh, yellow warblers. And throughout the United States, where the, which is the distribution of the yellow warbler, they are on willows. You can find them on willows. They're eating the bugs and they're eating the catkins. So that's kind of a nice association. Uh, you can't put willows in your yard most, most places but it's nice to know. And wild cherries, um, they both have the little cherry, which is just the right size for small birds and lots of different insects, 456 species in the United States on their leaves. Now, something interesting is that cherries get the Eastern tent caterpillar nests, which are quite unsightly. Um, and people, a lot of people don't want that, but guess what? A very sought after bird is an, a specialist for that. This strong bill of the yellow bill cuckoo can get through that tent and they're specialists in that. 
Now the sugar hackberry, those of you who go to the Lake Apopka Wildlife Drive know that the best warbler searching is right at the beginning, um, right past the ambassador kiosk, ambassador shelter in those trees there, which have decreased a bit, but that's, uh, those are the sugar hackberries. Sugarberry or hackberry, and I've seen it written sugar hackberry, so I like to say it that way. Lots of different species of caterpillars. I, I planted them in my yard and noticed that that's a, a good place for warblers. They're picking, gleaning is the term, with those beaks for the little caterpillars that roll the leaves or somehow are eating the, the new leaves. And it happens that that's a beautiful butterfly breeds on that too, the hackberry emperor. And another important tree to get in your yard is the sable or cabbage palm, our state tree. And the thing about it is the ratty looking undersides of the leaf are done by the palm leaf skeletonizer. That stuff is called frass and it's the excrement of a insect. And um, this particular skeletonizer is a specialty of the yellow-throated warbler. See that little moth, that's all it is, just a little moth like that. The sable cabbage palm also has fruit that's of a perfect size for birds and sweet actually. Um, the uh, robins can flock around and get that. And I, I'm nearing the end here, but butterfly caterpillars are not optimal for birds. All those bumps and things, those that have, can exude distasteful substances. The color warns the birds that this is not good. And plus the size is not right for the warblers. Maybe a blue jay might go for one of these. So again, what are the best trees for caterpillars in Central Florida? The oaks, the cherries, sugar hackberry, and that's a very fast growing one that you can plant right away, and the sable palm, just a few of the top ones. Where, not, where to buy native plants? Not here um, at this fruit stand. I mean, I'm, these are nice plants, but these are probably plants that are so easy to propagate because they are, invasive. They will go invasive in your yard. Plus they have the leathery waxy leaves. They're not suitable for the caterpillars and, and the caterpillars are specialists. So they wouldn't be on these plants. So they're not adding any value to your yard other than aesthetic. Where to buy the native plants? It's a specialized market. Um, some I might not have all the nurseries down, but these are the two big ones, green images out in Christmas. And this is one back from the eighties. It was the original one. Um, and the owner is a landscape architect who I've had, had the pleasure of working with on projects. And David Dryley is extremely knowledgeable. Everything I know about laying out my landscape and which plants will work, I really learned from him. So I still plug that nursery, even though he took a real hit in 2008 with the recession and it, you will find a lot of weeds in the pots, but those are native weeds. So you can find like three plants at, at once uh, when you go there and look for treasures. And there, his specialty is the palmettos, the silver palmettos. And then Green Isle Gardens is a very well-run nursery out, but you have to go all the way out to Groveland, but it has a great selection of plants. and. And to find a specific plant or to find nurseries, you go to the FAN, Florida Association of Native Nurseries. That's, they've got a nice website. And coming up soon is Backyard Biodiversity Day, an event from the Tar Flower Chapter of the Florida Native Plant Society that Orange Audubon co-sponsors. And um, they'll have lots of plants for sale, the suitable ones for us, and the the uh, volunteers are native plant aficionados and very knowledgeable. So this is an excellent time to go buy some native plants. And Orange Audubon will be there with a the booth. And if anybody feels like helping us, you can email. Um, this is our first venturing out, but I guess we're gonna do it with social distancing and masks and everything. 
Um, and then this is my final slide um, that Doug Tallamy, who I've described as a great guru of all this, Caterpillars for, for Birds, will be talking September 22nd on a Zoom program with Audubon Florida. And it's free and you can uh, find that by going to Audubon Florida's Facebook page. And um, then Orange Audubon will have Doug Tallamy coming for us, a, a program tapered, we're calling it our homegrown national park to try to make that point that we have to not only plant natives ourselves, but we have to educate on it and get our neighbors to do it. So we have an expanse of native habitat and that'll be February 18th. So any questions? That was, that was great, wonderful. Thank you. I have a question. Yes. When is the, the, the biodiversity day is uh, October 17th. Was that at Mead? Yeah, oh, yes, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, I missed, I missed where it was. I think I just misheard. I, so. I didn't, I probably didn't say uh, it's at Mead Botanic Garden. Okay, great. And there'll be walks in the morning, so you can just stay, you know, check out the plants after the walk. Any other questions on um, plants for birds and the caterpillar connection? I thought it was really interesting that the uh, the butterfly caterpillars are don't, the birds don't care about those. Yes, that was very interesting because a lot of people. I mean, I have uh, you know the the plants for the butterflies, but I I never thought about it. That these little that's, mic, they're called microlepidoptera. These little ones that they roll the leaves, they they, they try to hide in the leaves, um, but it, especially in the early spring on the oaks, you'll start to notice them. Sometimes they. Uh, come down on a thread, you know. This is thread of well, stuff. when I when I first got my Schumard oak, uh, I had thousands of caterpillars almost destroyed it. They they descended on it, uh -huh. and then it took it took they ate all the leaves. It took several days for the birds to find the caterpillars, and by that time, the the poor tree was it was really devastated. And the city said, "Well, if that happens again, it'll probably kill the tree." Uh -huh. <laughs> Well, the Schumard oak is farther from farther north. I really don't get it why they keep promoting the giving away or selling this Schumard oak. Did you did you get it at a? No, I, the city planted it on the easement. I didn't want it. I wanted a live oak, and they yeah. said well, we we want diversity. So if you'll take the Schumard, and I said, well, I don't. I really don't want it. And then you know they wouldn't give me a I, they wouldn't give me any live oaks. So anyway, that's what I got. But the caterpillars almost ate the whole thing. I mean, the first year I had it. Interesting. Yeah. Anything else? So, so you know oaks, cherries, hackberry, sugarberry, table palm. Those are the top four. And we'll, those of you who are around locally, will you'll have to pick up that flyer that Mary developed and I will all have more appreciation for it. I have a quick question. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the best trees at Mead is the mulberry tree. Obviously. Oh, yes. Okay, so all this discussion was not even touching on buried fruits, okay? Yeah, that's a whole nother subject. Well, and I was gonna ask, do the caterpillars use the mulberry tree as well? Is it like a double whammy for the berries and the caterpillars? You know, the mulberry is fuzzy. Right. The leaves are fuzzy, and uh, that's a protection from the caterpillars. So I, and, and, and I don't think Talamy had it listed. I can go back a few slides and try to see his list and see if he got it on there. Um, no. Uh. So that's just fruit, I guess. Yeah, well, I know we all want that in our yard. <laughs> um, and th there, are, there is a native mulberry, the red mulberry, it, it's not as prolific on, on fruit as the black mulberry that you have at Mead. Um, it also is what they call dioecious, which means um, male plants and female plants. So you got to be sure when you buy it that it already has fruit and get the female plant. <laughs> uh oh, I just bought one last year. I hope it's a good one. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? Of course, the beauty berry is great. And I could, I could go on about the different 
berried plants. Judy uh, is a native plant though? Oh, yes. Yes. I had no idea. Well, um, so does the beauty berry get caterpillars? It also has fuzzy leaves. So I, we'll have to look more uh, individually, but um, I, I- I mean, I have one, but I've never seen caterpillars on it. The, the birds come for the berries, but I, I've never yeah. noticed any caterpillars. Right, so we've got these two different categories of, and everybody understands about the berries. Yeah. And Bob has a point that he was saying that during early migration, fruit is important because sometimes the caterpillars, before the caterpillars are readily available, so. Yes, that's true. And, and there's one species famous for that, the um, yellow rumped warbler. It, it has the digestive enzymes to digest the berries of wax myrtle, which have wax, which is a tricky to, to digest. And so it uh, can live farther north, the farthest north of the winter, of winter, the farthest north, because it's eating those berries. Um, yeah, that's another story. Do we know if birds, <laughs> excuse me, eat coffee? Because I bought some of those wild coffees. Yeah, they do. And the, okay. that'll, that'll be in your yard after a few, after 10 years or so, you'll start getting them all over. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's see. Your yard um, is beautiful. Thank it you. is. Yeah, um, I, it had a good foundation, and then I've been working on it hard. Um, but this thing about the new leaves, and these birds are going north, they're just passing through because there's these enormous forests of the east um, that they are able to, uh, uh, you know, live in. It has habitat for their nests and to uh, feed their young the caterpillars. Any more questions? That looks like a fuzzy leaf. <laughs> Which one? You passed it by already. So what do we think about there, that one? What do we think about cherry laurel? Oh, okay. Cherry laurel has great seeds for birds. You'll get robins coming, visiting to it, um, cedar wax wings. But it's not as good as its sister species, the um, wild cherry or black cherry. Black cherry. For, for the um, caterpillars. And the black cherry, does it do the same thing? Um, as cherry laurel with the little uh, shoots, shoots everywhere. I mean, it's like no. a forest in three weeks. It does not. It does not. So I, I would not recommend a cherry laurel to anyone. And so if you have cherry laurel, swap it. It's invasive, isn't it? it it's a native that's aggressive and basically invasive in that sense. Yeah, I have it, I have it all over. <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's crazy to maintain. Yeah. Put, keep it at bay. Yeah. But the black cherry then is the one you want to get. Uh -huh. You know any, well, I can look it up. The name Prunus serotina. All right, well, I'll let everybody go. I know we have a lot of Zoom meetings <laughs> multiple nights and it's been really nice having you with us. Nobody has any more questions? Thank you. There's one more question.